All right, first, um, I'd like to thank Steve and uh, everyone else at Science at Cal for the invitation to come and talk. Um, it's really a pleasure to come and talk to the general community about biophysics research. Um, I, I'm really hoping my goal today is to convince you that biophysics is a really interesting field um, that uh, everyone should you know, keep looking into. Um, I was an undergraduate here, as Steve mentioned, um, doing molecular cell biology and bioengineering. Uh, and it was really here that one of my uh, upper division biochemistry professors, uh, Carlos Bustamante, who's actually my current boss now, um, initially introduced to me the idea that uh, you can think about biology like they were really just biological machines. And as someone with an interest in engineering, this really caught my attention. So that's really what the message I'm trying to convey to you today. Um, I'd like to start the talk. Um, this was a, a pretty recent uh, realization for me. Uh, I came across this. It's actually a group in Switzerland that um, put this together. What you're looking at here are actually the locations of uh, aircraft traveling across the world. And what you can see here is this shadow streaming across from right to left. And that's, that's nighttime. You can see, for example, Europe right now is lit up brightly with all the flights going on. And eventually, right now, you can see the US is kind of dead, and as soon as you see sunrise on the east coast, it lights up again. Um, and so really what you're looking at, and you can stare at this all day, it's kind of fun. Um, <laughs> but uh, what, the point that I want to make here is, is really simple. This is an example of regulation. So uh, based on what time of day it is, our, our ecosystem is basically taking off or quieting down. Um, and this sort of regulation, uh, believe it or not, uh, happens inside of our cells. So this is probably the closest example I could find. Um, so what you're seeing here is a eukaryotic cell. So this is a cell um, that's very much like ours. Um, and what you're looking at are single protein molecules that are emanating from a, a, a structure known as the centrosome. Uh, and what you're seeing are single, single transport events being streamed across the cell. And cells have this kind of transport happening all the time uh, to regulate when certain genes are turned on and when certain proteins need to be transported to certain regions of your cell. And you can do this based on whether nutrients are available or depleted or whether you have sugar or lactose in your solution or sometimes whether it's bright or dark outside. So this kind of regulation, yes? So this is actually, um, so the centrosome is actually or arranged with um, radially uh, orienting microtubules. So what you're looking at here is transport on those, those radiating structures. So, so, um, but, so I just really want to draw the connection between you know, what, what you saw before and what you're seeing here. Um, but this is really uh, kind of getting to what interests me about biology. And that's that um, if you walk away with no other message from this talk, uh, I, I hope it's that um, many of the catalytic proteins that are necessary for, for us to survive, I think can be best described as nanomachines. And I, I find, even though it may be um, for some a, a trivial distinction to talk about uh, proteins and catalytic proteins specifically as nanomachines, uh, I've found from, from my graduate work and now my postdoctoral studies, the, the way that you think about a system can pretty dramatically alter the approaches that you think about applying to trying to understand those systems. And I found it quite helpful to think about these, these machines, that, or these proteins as nanomachines. And you oftentimes hear them referred to as motor proteins as well. Um, and in particular, what I, what I, I think you know, that, that kind of thinking makes you immediately think of is that the, the function of any machine is intrinsically tied to its design. And molecular biologists have actually uh, formulated a paradigm called the structure-function relationship that uh, has been around for, I mean, many, many years. Um, but you know, now what we as biologists and biophysicists are trying to do is really understand how it is that these machines work. And uh, we've, this is where, really where biophysicists have, have, um, have come around to begin to try to address these questions using very specialized techniques, some of which I'm hoping to introduce today. So what I want to do to start with is uh, give you uh, just a very basic background, first of all, what I mean when I say a protein. Um, so uh, just to be clear, so we're all on the same page, 
Um, a protein is a, a polymer, so it's a, a, basically a string of what are known as amino acids, and these, these amino acids have a very specific chemical, chemical structure. Uh, there are only 20 different amino acids in, in our bodies. Um, you string these different amino acids together, so you see lysine and leucine that are, are here. Okay, These are basically the, the letters that form the alphabet of, of biology, and they string together and make these words. That we call that a protein. Um, the, when you string these together and let them go in solution, they'll spontaneously form these very interesting structures. And, and what, I'm, what I'm showing here is one, one of these uh, structures called an alpha helix. Um, and ultimately, if you get enough of these forming in a long chain, eventually they'll form what's known as a tertiary structure. And this is really what we typically think of as a, a, a protein. Um, and so we're gonna, I'm going to show you some, some more examples uh, of what kind of functions you can have with these proteins. And, and I think as an engineer, it's, it's really remarkable what has evolved in biology using uh, a building block that as engineers we are completely uncomfortable with. I mean, we're, we're used to thinking about metals and structures and machining, uh, but now we're talking about a soft, compliant polymer uh, that can form structures all on its own. And I, I think that's probably one of the biggest engineering challenges uh, we have, is understanding how this happens. All right, here's, here's one uh, really classic, or I'm giving you two classic examples of rotary motors that happen in biology. So what you, I'm showing you here is the flagellar motor complex. So this is actually um, what's responsible for whipping the tail of a bacterium uh, to provide propulsion for that bacterium. Um, and what I want to point out here is that you have stator and rotor. That's actually what they're called. These are, these are engineering terms for rotary engines. Um, but just take, take a, a look at the complexity of this, this sort of design. This is a this is a particular rendition, but it it it, um, it it really does look not too dissimilar from this. So I mean, you actually will see, for example, these sorts of structures in the flagellum, and and I think this is as close as you can put that to it. But um, just just note that all of these are different proteins, colored different colors, um, and they assemble to form this really complicated motor. Uh, and it really is, by all definitions that you can think of, it is a motor. This is a machine. Um, one other example is known as F1 ATPase. This is what's responsible for providing energy for our cells. Uh, and uh, what, what's interesting about it is it actually rotates uh, a, a, a part of its, its, its body during the mechanism. And if you, uh, in this case, they, label, they basically attach this, this filament that you could actually see rotate. What I'm showing here are time lapse signatures of the rotation of that filament during the activity. Um, so I, I, I should give you a disclaimer. This isn't my system uh, to, to study, so I, I don't want to make mistakes. But um, I, I, can, I can only tell you right now, from my perspective, that, that as an engineering team, this is pretty impressive. So I mean, I'd be happy to give that to back to you if you want. But, um, but anyways, uh, I, I'd like to just very quickly draw the analogy. Uh, anyone who drives a Mazda, it's a good chance that you have a, what's known as a Wankel engine. Um, and this is a, a rotary engine uh, that's, that's used even today, so I just want to draw the parallel. Um, but this is, again, what we're comfortable thinking about as engineers. This is a system that's completely alien to us. All right, um, another system. So this is, this is a system that we study in the Bustamante lab uh, here on campus. Um, and this is a, a viral packaging motor. Uh, so what I'm showing here is this is uh, this is actually uh, an electron microscopy image uh, that's reconstructed, showing you an empty capsid. So this capsid of this virus needs to be basically its sole function is to be packaged with the genome of the virus, and this is necessary for the virus to propagate um, and continue its life cycle. To get the genome into the virus, it, it uses this this complex. This is a um, packaging motor for 529 uh, bacteriophage. Uh, and what you're seeing here is uh, the DNA threaded through this complex, and uh, this is an artist's rendition now of the packaging of, of, this, of this genome. Now, the interesting thing here is that uh, this motor is incredibly powerful for the size scales we're talking about. So we're talking about proteins that are on the scale of nanometers, and a nanometer, just for reference, is more or less about 100,000 
Okay, so we're, we're talking very small size scales, but it manages to pack, package this DNA into this empty capsid pressures that are comparable to what's inside of a champagne bottle. And I mean, this is a remarkable feat. Um, and one of the experiments that was done in my lab in particular it was trying to understand this packaging process. The, the trick and the complexity with biophysics research is that we deal with things that are on scales that we fundamentally cannot see. So everything in biology on nanometer size scales is below the what's known as the diffraction limit, which essentially means that you can't physically see um, the, the details of this particular particular motor system. So what we have to do is essentially invent techniques to be able to, to resolve certain functions that we're trying to study. So in this case, what I'm showing here are, uh, is a typical technique that we would use. We have beads that we can see that we attach to, to the motor. What, what you can't see here is that there's actually a single virus that's on this left bead, and there is actually a single piece of DNA that's strung between now, what, what you're going to see in the movie that I'm about to show you is that you'll see that these beads come closer and closer together. Now, that's, that's allowing us to watch the packaging of this genome in time. These two beads getting closer together, while indirect, is still telling us something about the system that we can't see. Okay? It may look a little magical, but just to convince you that the DNA is really there, there's a, a third bead right here in the very center. What you're going to see is the consequence of packaging DNA, which is a helical structure, okay, and the consequence of that is that this small bead will rotate as the genome is being packaged. And if you sit here and watch long enough, you'll see those two beads getting closer together, and then the, the movie will repeat. You'll see them extend apart. And this is how we essentially, uh, this is one of the techniques that we use to, to extract information about how this, this viral genome is being packaged by this, this packaging. These are uh, two micron beads, so uh, two micrometers, uh, and then this, this is a very small 0.5 micrometer bead, but 500 nanometers in size. Okay, one other illustrative example I want you to look up here for a second. Uh, you're going to see that this is a this is a myosin motor. Now, um, I'm not I wasn't lying when I said you can't see things. This isn't uh, using light. But we're, this is a specialized technique. Here where we're actually feeling. So you can feel much with better resolution than you can actually see. So these are a technique called atomic force microscopy. This was a, a group in Japan that did this. And this is a real-time observation of um, a motor known as myosin, and it, and it takes steps on this filament known as an actin filament inside of the cell. And so what you're seeing here is really a stepping motor. This is uh, using fuel, and consuming fuel, it's producing force, has a certain velocity. And all of this is being regulated within the cell. So uh, I, I just found this to be a pretty remarkable insight to you know, how we can start to understand what in this case is actually you know, a still complicated system. We still really understand very little about this motor, meaning if we change its structure a little bit, we have no idea about how it is that that's going to change the motor. But if you change my engine in a car from a four-cylinder six-cylinder engine, you have some prediction about what that's going to do. It's going to make it faster, higher horsepower, better torque. But we don't have that kind of predictive power when it comes to biology. So, yeah. So this is known as atomic force microscopy. Essentially what you have is you have a stylus like you have in an old record player. This stylus is uh, on the size scale of nanometers. You can essentially tap on a surface and scan the surface, and so it's like reading Braille. Okay, You're, in this case, though, the Braille is a molecule that's walking. Okay. All right. So now that I've convinced you of uh, that, this is of course an interesting system to, to look at. It's very pretty and captivating images. Now I have to turn to the protein that I study, which is perhaps a, a little uh, less visual uh, because it doesn't have legs. So this is a protein known as RNA polymerase. So if I were to show you that stepping motor where you could literally see this, this walking motion, you could relate to that. But now we're dealing with something that looks like this. It's 
one of um, one of my colleagues referred to it as a, a it looks like a glob of spaghetti, and that's really what we're talking about is a single amino a, a polypeptide chain that folds up on itself. You look at it, you really would have no idea where the top, the bottom, the left, or the right is. But this is what it looks like. Uh, so RNA polymerase, because this is going to be the focus of the rest of the presentation. Um, it, its job is basic. It, it's really the central player. It, it's one of the central players in all of biology. Its job is really important. It, it, its role is to basically read the DNA in your genome and produce a message that is made of RNA. And that RNA is later used as a building block for making proteins, so more proteins. So whenever you talk about gene regulation, uh, so genes being turned on or turned off in response to, you know, you're hungry one day, so you're going to produce more insulin, for example, or less insulin. That regulation happens at this level, okay? You have RNA polymerases inside of your cell that are essentially told to turn on or turn off certain um, the downside of this is that RNA polymerase takes a step size that's about 100 times smaller than myosin. So what I was just showing you in that video was 100 times larger step size than what we're seeing here. So even if you did do an AFM measurement, you really wouldn't see its legs moving. You wouldn't you'd probably not be able to see it take individual steps. But that's really fundamental to understanding how this motor actually works. Um, one of the subtleties I want to point out here, too, is that for a number of motors inside of biology, they're known as Brownian ratchets. And I'm showing you just a graphical illustration here of what, a Brownian, what I mean when I say a Brownian ratchet. What you're seeing here are molecules from the environment. So these are water molecules that are acting against this, this propeller here. And if you have this, this ball system here, it can only turn in one direction. And basically the idea is, is that you have random motion that's acting against this, this paddle, but only when that random motion moves it to, in, in counterclockwise direction in this case will it actually advance. That sort of energy is the energy that RNA polymerase is using to, to propel itself along the DNA. It, it allows the water, the bombardment of these water molecules colliding with it, to let it push it forward but then it resists motion pushing it backward. So in this case, its fuel is really the thermal environment. This is where its fuel is really, in this case, looking at um, you know, it's, it's water acting against it. So um, now to understand how this motor works, I need to I need to start at the, the rest of the presentation from this point forward is not only gonna be talking about RNA polymerase. But it's also going to introduce the idea of uh, single molecule biophysics. This is the field that I'm, I'm involved with right now. Um, and I have to explain to you why it is that despite the fact that biologists for you know, many, many years have been studying biology in, in populations, they're looking at test tubes and millions and million, millions of molecules. You could do many experiments with that. But ultimately, to understand aspects of motion at these size scales, it's, it's really important that you end up looking at one molecule at a time. And, and I have to convince you now why it is that I spend most of my time building microscopes and specialized techniques to look at it just one molecule at a time when it would be much, much easier not to have to do that. Um, but the best, yeah. Uh, no, this is a single-stranded nucleic acid. Yeah. Um, Okay, so to the, I, I realize this is a digression, but I think it's really illustrative. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a step back, and um, first I have to like talk about what RNA polymerase does in its different stages. Um, so I'm gonna first introduce to you what RNA polymerase was when it was introduced to me in biology class. Okay, and then I'm gonna introduce to you how it is that I like to think about it as an, as an engineer, and I want to explain how it is that um, these various stages give, give rise to a number of very interesting mechanical features of this molecule that, as an engineer, I'm trying to take advantage of now in my, in my research. Okay, so um, the first thing you need to know about RNA polymerase is that it has a, there, there is something known as a promoter sequence in DNA. It's a specific sequence of bases, A, Z, G, Z's, uh, that an RNA polymerase binds very specifically so out of the three billion bases that are inside of your genome, 
there is only a very specific sequence that RNA polymerase recognizes as essentially the start site for where it starts reading a gene. Okay, so this really marks the beginning of where a gene is downstream. Now, RNA polymerase comes in here, and in my biology classes, it was always shown as an oval. Um, and, and it, you know, if you think about what's going on here, it's really a remarkable feat, right? You have a three-dimensional helical structure with all of these A, C, C, and D. And all of those bases are actually buried on the inside of the structure, right? I mean, this is, this is remarkable now. So the RNA polymerase, it's increasingly thought, is actually recognizing the three-dimensional structure of, of the DNA. So there are subtleties in how it is that the helix is arranged that is a consequence of the different bases that are in there. They're ultimately cueing the RNA polymerase that this is actually your target site. But just that, that simple process alone is something that as an engineer, we have no idea how to, how to develop a system that, that, that complicated. Um, the next thing that happens is the RNA polymerase has to access the bases that are, again, are on the inside of the helix. And it does this by forming what's known as an open complex. It literally opens this, this, this helix. Consequence of that is that it has to un, uh, untwist the, the, the DNA right in the center of it, but that, con that results in over-twisting the DNA on, on the outside. And so this is a, a torsional energy that has to be produced by this, by this mo molecule. It has to do this under the conditions that it's operating in, without fuel. It has to find a way to actually rip open the, the, the helix and start reading the bases The next thing that happens is that the protein, so now it begins synthesizing the RNA. It starts reading the DNA and transcribing an RNA that I showed you in the previous slide. Uh, now, this is perhaps uh, the most interesting phase of transcription from my, my perspective. Uh, and that's because the RNA polymerase that was originally optimized in its function for finding and recognizing that very specific promoter sequence now has to start doing something completely different. It now has to optimize its design for transcribing hundreds of thousands of bases with high fidelity, no errors, and not stopping, right? So it's not surprising that the structure of this, of this polymerase changes quite dramatically throughout this motion and throughout this phase of transcription. And when I was taking this in biology class, it, the square now, so that's the conformational change. <laughs> That I, I wish. So, um, okay, so once this process happens, it, you know, not surprisingly, this is a process that's very error prone. The RNA polymerase tries many, many times sometimes to, to get to the point where it's actually transcribing. And ultimately, when its structure is completely changed, it can proceed. Now, um, it'll, that last phase is called the elongation. Um, and, uh, okay, I. I hate to have to ask this question, but I found that it's actually essential. How many people here actually remember what a foam cord looks like? <laughs> there are people in the back who have never seen a foam cord. Okay. So a foam cord really, it, it looks like a helix, okay? And um, anyone who has had a foam cord knows that the reason we got rid of them is because they would always tangle up on themselves, right? Uh, that actually happens in DNA. And why does that happen? It's because this RNA polymerase has its finger inside of the helix. So you can imagine what happens when you have a finger inside the foam cord. You start moving in one direction. You'll over-twist the head. You'll untwist behind. That's exactly what happens in biology. And it's actually a, um, a, a useful aspect of, of this process. And bacteria, in fact, have, have used that as a way to turn on and off genes. Just the act of knowing which gene is turned on tells other genes to turn off based on the, the twisting and the kinking that's happening in the DNA that's behind and ahead of the polymerase. So all of these things are, I think, really interesting aspects of, of transcription by RNA polymerase. Um, and I, I hope I've conveyed to you why we have to move beyond the simple picture. Yes, sorry. They're complementary. And they're, they're, they're complementary and they're anti-parallel. So the what that means is that the bottom strand, for example, that's being read by the RNA polymerase is oriented in one direction. The complementary strand is pointed in the opposite direction. And by complement, I mean the A's will always have a, a neighbor on the other strand called the T's. Okay. So 
All right, so I said there's a dramatic rearrangement that happens with the RNA polymerase. This is what it looks like for one particular RNA polymerase from bacteria phase. And what I want to point out here is the difference between thinking of something as a circle and a square versus what's really going on. This is, this is a glob of spaghetti, and this is really more or less what it looks like. I mean, these, these nice helices that you're seeing here are a little exaggerated in terms of the artistic rendition, but more or less what you're seeing here is what it would look like if you could see this thing. And what I'm showing here are the conformational rearrangements that happen during that circle to square transition. And this is a bacteriophage T7 RNA polymerase. This is kind of my, my love uh, professionally. Um, and um, so uh, what, what, I, what I want you to point out here, or notice, is that there, there really is uh, about 25% of this structure is undergoing this large scale 180 degree swing um, from the initiation to the elongation phase. So what I want you to think about uh, to prolong my airplane analogy is anyone who's been on an airplane knows that when you take off or land, the flaps on the air, the, the, the airfoils actually go down. What's happening there is you're making a trade-off. You say we need the most lift possible so we can take off and land at low speeds. And we're making a trade-off in the fact that we have increase of drag. So we're burning more fuel than we have. But it's important because we don't want to run off the runway. Okay, so the same thing happens with, with biology. So in this case, the RNA polymerase structure that was optimized for finding the promoter is one structure. But then once it wants to take off, it needs to undergo this large-scale rearrangement. And just like this, the airplane, when you're at 40,000 feet, rescinds the, the flaps to lower the drag, and it's optimizing itself for you know, fuel consumption at that point. All right. So the question that I study now as a postdoc here at Berkeley is how is it that this thing actually moves? Okay, I tried to give you guys some, some basic under, uh, background of the problem, but now we're getting to the heart of it. How do we follow something that we can't actually see moving along DNA? And we do it with, I mean, 0.34 nanometers is the step size. So each step that's being taken is 0.34 nanometers. That is three hydrogen atoms lined up just to give you an appreciation of the difficulty. And you have to do this in the presence of this Brownian motion from all of the water that's bombarding this thing. So it's a chaotic environment. Okay, so now I have to convince you that single molecule biophysics is important. The analogy that I wanted to introduce is one that I, I think is kind of fun to talk about. Um, Edward Maybridge is actually a Bay Area um, artist. Uh, he was a photographer in the 19th century. Uh, he's commissioned by Leland Stanford, who uh, was governor of California, and you know, you'll know you know he was named, the University Down South was named after him. Um, but he was commissioned by Leland Stanford to answer uh, a question of the popular debate at the time. I would say it's popular, not scientific, because um, the, the, I think the scientists were pretty much in agreement about this. But the popular debate was, do all four legs of a horse come off the ground when it's at its top speed? So when it's, when it's at a gallop, does it, ever, does it ever transiently take its feet off the ground? And the problem is, is that you, if you were to look at a horse going full speed, it's moving too fast for your eyes to actually see what's going on with its, with its legs. So Edward Maybridge was a photographer, and Leland Stanford said, well, you should be able to photograph this and provide the evidence that you know, really makes this, this point. So um, Edward Maybridge, uh, though he and I come from very different backgrounds, I completely appreciate the problem that he had. Because at the time, he was limited by technology. So first, what he realized is that you can't make this observation if you're looking at a group of horses. Because if you have a group of horses, if I see it, uh, like a leg there, I can't tell you if this leg belongs to horse number nine or horse number eight, or maybe it's a horse in the background I can't see. So, very quickly, he realized that you need to do this with just one horse at a time. Just like I look at single molecules. Um, and what, what I want to point out here is that even with a single horse at a time, he was limited by technology at the time. And the two, the two fundamental technical issues that he had to overcome was that the film wasn't sensitive enough to capture fast motion. So they were using collodion at the time, and they had to basically come up with new formulations of film that were sensitive enough to actually capture this 
But then on top of that, mechanical shutters for cameras that we're all used to using now hadn't been invented. In fact, the most popular way that they actually made those images was using a hat that was held over the lens of the camera. Then they exposed it and then, and then darkened it when they, when they were done exposing. So that couldn't work if you're trying to do very fast motion. I mean, your, your hand's not fast enough and your film's not sensitive enough. So Maybridge actually was commissioned to overcome these. And it took them many, many years, quite to the dismay of, of Stanford. But um, you know, they had a falling out at some point. But it's a very interesting book if you guys want to read it. Um, OK, so ultimately he overcame this. And what he, what he did was he looked at horses and what are the four different modes of transportation that were known at the time. The only thing that people really knew well was that there were these different beats. So the first thing that they would do is like listen. So when the horse is moving slowly, you would hear beat, 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 beat. So that would be a four beat gate, okay? That's the hoof impacting the ground. So this was something they were listening to. And when it sped up, it, it went into a, a canter, and at a canter, you hear two beats. So so for every cycle of its step, you only hear two beats. And they, they really did understand why it is that you would only hear four or two at the slowest speed. But what was a mystery at the time was the three and four beat gate. So this was when you're, you're actually speeding up now. And they, they really couldn't understand why it is that you have you know, a horse making three beats, and then the, at the top speed the horse makes four beats. And what I just want to show you here, these are the actual images that Maybridge was able to capture. You can see even at the fastest, you can see that he was able to actually distinguish the, the locomotion um, it, with, with very high detail. And this is, this is really what we're trying to do now. We're inventing microscopes all the time to try to extract the best possible detail about the molecules we're studying. All right, so just for fun, um, these uh, Maybridge, I'm showing you now uh, the results of his study. Um, so Maybridge, not often credited with it, but he was one of the pioneers in developing stop motion photography. And so he would assemble these different frames using multiple different cameras. And then, he, and then here I'm stringing them together into a movie so you can actually see the, the, the motion. And the four beat gate here is called the four beat lateral gate when the horse is going slow enough. And you can, I'm ordering the hooves that are taken off the ground. So the, the rear left first, and then the front left, and then the rear right, and the front right. So that's actually how it is that uh, the, the four-beat lateral gate is, is done. Um, the canter, it's called a two-beat diagonal gate. You can see that it alternates taking diagonal, diagonal steps, okay? Um, moving on to the three-beat gate. So now they understand why this is a three-beat gate. The rear left takes off, and then both the back right and the front left take off together. And then you have the front one. That's why you have three sounds when you hear at, at this close to maximal speed. And finally, when a horse is galloping, you can see that it's again a four beat gate again, but now it's not a lateral gate. It, it's taking the, the back two first and then the front two. So these are four completely different ways that the horse is found to, to actually move at different speeds. And they're now you know, the conclusion from major just studies was actually a biomechanics study. Whether he wanted it to be or not, it was a study of biomechanics, just on much larger scale than what I study now. And so what I'm showing here is what they've been called, walking, trotting, cantering, galloping. And because of his, his galloping images, you can clearly see that the horse actually does raise all four of its hooves off the ground. Okay, so the story may be interesting, um, but back to why I wanted to tell it. So now, the challenge facing biophysicists. Imagine doing Maybridge's studies, identical, answering the same question about whether a horse's hooves come off the ground at a gallop, but now you only had information about the position of the rider's head over time. <laughs> and it moved randomly. OK, so this is a subtlety, but um, in the system that I study, it's not deterministic. So the horse isn't always doing the same whole, the, same order of the, of the legs, okay? So some, some of the molecules we study are, you know, moving quite randomly, and so we have to make sense out of this. But to just give you an appreciation of what a study like this would look like, uh, here's the galloping images I've dotted where the writer's head is. I plot its height over time. You 
see how it is the height is doing something over time, but it's certainly not giving you information about the position of the legs or whether they're all contacting the ground. And this is why, as biophysicists, we have no choice but to develop mechanical models for our system, how we think it might happen, and then find ways to systematically test those questions. Okay? That's why we're always inventing new techniques and building new microscopes, is because we have to test different models that we have. I mean, this is an exercise in imagination, if you will. You know? And ultimately, the science part of it is testing those ideas. All right, so again, following the writer's head, so I showed you before this very specialized technique of myosin walking on actin. So this is the, the ultimate example that we could hope to ever get with, with the system. Here's a, a comparable example that we typically use in, in the lab. So what, what I've been showing here is a myosin walking on actin attached to a very large beam. I've already showed you what some of those beams look like. You can clearly see them in the microscope. But what we do, what we what we usually do is just track the position of this of this bead over time, and we construct data that looks like this. So this is the rider's head moving in time. You can clearly see each step that's taken by this molecule. You can see it takes a step, and then it waits, and it takes a step, and it waits. You can also see that the time between the steps is totally random. There, there is no you know, fixed period of time where it says, okay, I'm going to wait one second before the next step, and then the next second. This is, this is what I meant by it's moving random. So we have to, as biophysicists, try to understand these systems with very limited information, operating under environments that we're really not comfortable thinking about. Whoa, okay. Yes, yes it does. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you noticed that. Um, so I'm going to explain this in a second, but uh, in this particular case, the bead is actually being held by uh, an invisible string that is made of light. And I'm going to introduce this in a little bit, but uh, the technique that we use uh, oftentimes, uh, we, we essentially focus light onto a bead like this. When you focus enough light, you actually can take advantage of a relative, relativistic phenomena where wherein the, the photons that are entering the bead are essentially refracted. The bead is acting like a lens, it bends the light. And every time you bend the light, you can actually impart a momentum. So this is, think about a, a, a garden hose being you know, shot at an angle vein. Uh, just the deflection of that, that garden hose from, you know, from this to that is going to impart a force. And the same thing, can, that, that analogy holds when you send enough light being bent by this bead. So it essentially acts like an invisible string. So what you're seeing here is the motor is acting against the string, and then at a certain point, there's so much force acting against the motor, it lets go, and then it starts over again, and then it lets go, and it starts over again. Okay. So I'll get, I'll get into that a little bit later, but... Yes. Right, so we're operating, so most of these motors operate on millisecond time scales. So, I mean, they're... So this is really the challenge, right? I mean, just like Maybridge had the issue of film not being sensitive enough, we have the challenge that our molecules move too fast. Okay? We don't have instruments that are sensitive enough to actually capture very fast, very small motion. That's the technical challenge that we are currently trying to overcome. We, we've spent a lot of time trying to, to measure motions on nanometer scales at millisecond time resolution. So that, that is the principal challenge, yeah. Yeah, so that's actually a very good question. Um, and unfortunately, that really isn't an appropriate control that we, we could do for the, the effect of the bead. But what I can say is, is that a lot of these systems are, are compared. So, um, we, we would actually attach a bead to a molecule, we'd watch it in time, and then you would use that fluorescence image that I was showing you when you do these striations through the cell, uh, emanating from that one point early on in the presentation. You can use something like that, where you attach, instead of a bead, you attach a small fluor fluorescent molecule, and see if the speeds look the same, things like that. But again, we have to do something to the molecule in order to see it. And even this image up here, I can't tell you that there is nothing that's happening because the stylus keeps tapping on it. 
I mean, these controls are very difficult to, to actually have. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm sorry, can you can you speak up? I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh. Right, so um, so the answer is yes. Um, so the, I mean there are many molecules that respond to certain drugs. So I mean there are specifically drugs designed to interfere with the activity of certain molecules. Well, the RNA polymerase that I study, for example, is a target of many drugs um, that are known to exist. Um, and, and really studying that motion uh, of these molecules under those conditions tells us a lot about how it is that these drugs are actually acting. So it's not necessarily that we want to slow down the molecule by using the drug. We want to study what the drug's doing to the molecule. We want it to slow down the molecule's motion. What we usually do is just lower the fuel. So in this case, it's burning a molecule called ATP. So what we do is just drive down the fuel, and that slows its motion. Um, so, so we can also slow it down by actually imparting a higher force in most cases. So we can actually pull against the motion and slow it down that way as well. Sorry? Cool? Uh, yes, so you can, you, you can actually cool the samples. I mean, there, we're limited to how much we can cool it. So, I mean, below four degrees, we're worried about our samples freezing. Um, and if you think about the change in thermal energy from cooling from 25 to 4, it's, you know, I mean, it's not a huge difference, maybe 5% but, um, of the energy. But, I mean, it's true. We could heat it up or cool it. So. Okay, so back to the question I posed earlier, which is, all right, how does the RNA polymerase actually work? All right, so I mentioned this very briefly, uh, but I'll explain it a little bit better now. Um, again, if you focus uh, a laser and focus it very tightly onto a refractive bead that's made of glass, for example, or polystyrene, uh, there's going to be uh, a force that arises because this bead is bending the light. And if the bead moves to the right, that force gets larger on the right side, so it pushes it back. And if it goes to the left, the force drives it back to the center. So in all cases, the bead is basically being you know, oscillating back and forth, back and forth, and being pulled back in by this, by this force. So essentially, this acts like a very, very, very soft spring. It's a very compliant spring. It doesn't take a lot of force to knock the bead out of the trap. In fact, just oftentimes, just blowing water past it will be enough to kick it out. But it's soft enough that it's on scales that are relevant to biology. So the, the forces that biology imparts are more or less measurable using these spring constants. Um, so what we do is we trap one bead, we trap a second bead, okay, so we have two different springs here. The RNA polymerase we attach to one of the beads, and then what we do is we connect the two with the DNA. So just like I showed you before, the image of two beads with an invisible piece of DNA between them, that's exactly what we're doing in our measurement, except for not having a virus here, we have an RNA polymerase. And essentially what we do is we monitor the motion of those two beads over time as they get closer together. And because of a number of technical benefits of this kind of system, um, we are very close to being able to see single steps being taken by this, by this molecule. So an example of what the data um, look like, and let me just first illustrate this point. Um, the way that we initially thought about how it is that this molecule behaves is I'm showing here, uh, it's at position zero, so this would be on one base, and then flip plus one would be the next base, so this is after taking a step, after taking a step. And in the language of chemistry, uh, there's a rate constant. So this essentially says what the probability is of the molecule moving from this position to this position in a certain period of time. And this was really kind of the simplistic idea that, that had emerged for a very long time because when we looked at molecule, many of these molecules all at the same time, we would only see that on average they all kept going up. You know, they would all keep producing more and more RNA. Now, what became evident when you started looking at the single molecule data is this, which is that it's not just that it keeps moving forward, 
not that there's just a constant driving force pushing it continuously along. What you see, and this is again looking at the optical trapping data that I was just showing you, these beads are coming closer together and we're looking at the position of, of, of the bead over time. What you can see is that the, the advancement of this polymerase is actually punctuated by these pauses, these very pronounced pauses. So it's not a continuous translocation. There, there are these pauses that are happening. And what we've learned right now, what we know now, in, I'm talking about in the last one or two years, is that these pauses really are essential for how it is that your cells regulate the activity of this polymerase. So what we, the, the kind of information that we can get from data like this, uh, we can look at how long each of the pause lasts. We can look at how often they occur. So uh, what's, the what's the probability that uh, over a thousand bases you'll actually end up pausing? And finally, you can get this uh, velocity uh, as it's moving. Um, we call that pause-free velocity. This is the, the stretches of transcription where it's not actually engaged in a pause. And from this, what's emerged is that this, uh, this diagram I showed you here is actually not correct. Um, there's, there's actually uh, what we call an off pathway. So this is, this is essentially saying that when an RNA polymerase is sitting at a given base, it has two choices. It can either move forward or it can, it can actually engage in a pause. And, it, and now we know that it can actually backtrack. It can go backwards along the template. It can go to the minus one or minus two. And at every base, the polymerase has to make a decision whether to move forward or backwards. And all of this is a completely random determination by the polymerase. And so this is really the, the simplest way of our more complete understanding of, of an RNA polymerase. But it ultimately is required that we understand this in order to, again, understand how the design is affecting these behaviors of the machine. Yes? Uh, in, in some cases, they are, yes. But uh, there, so sequence specificity, what the question is, is, is it possible that an RNA polymerase just happens to hit a GGG in a row and then engage in a pause? And yes, there, there are known sequence-dependent pauses, but we think that it's not all based on the sequence, that there's a that there's an actual probability that due to thermal energy, it's going to be driven backwards. Um, and in my lab, what we study is actually proteins that, that drive the RNA polymerase into these off-pathway pauses. And we try to understand how it, what makes it pause more, what makes it pause less, and what, we, what can be done to regulate this. All right, so this is from our very recent paper. I promise it's the only slide of really technical data. Um, but so I'm showing you here again this this two bead assembly optical traps. Uh, we have a bead here. The DNA is strung between them. We have the RNA polymerase at the bottom bead. Um, and what this study was for as just an example of what sorts of questions we ask and answer using this technique is what we're looking at are the effects of two transcription factors. So these are pro other proteins that happen inside of your cell that are meant to facilitate transcription, make transcription more likely to occur or be regulated less. Um, and what we would do is study traces that look like this. What we're looking at is uh, now force on the y-axis. And, and picanewtons, just for clarification on scale, a picanewton is about the weight of a red blood cell. So it's a very, very small weight. Um, but the what we're doing is monitoring the force that this molecule is exerting as it's pulling these beads outside of their spring. And what you can see is that here's the, here's the polymerase all by itself in the absence of no transcription factor. It'll basically uh, transcribe and transcribe until it reaches what's called a stall force, and then it just doesn't move. It can't continue under these forces. What you can immediately see is that in the presence of these two proteins, RNA polymerase can actually exceed this initial stall force and rise to much higher forces. So this is the first effect that these both of these transcription factors are doing is essentially allowing the polymerase to, to be stronger. It can, it can transcribe more effectively against higher forces. Um, and you can also see another interesting difference between the two. Here's one of those transcription factors, PF2S, is what it's called. And what you can see here is an example of an RNA polymerase that's backtracking. So this is an RNA polymerase that is transcribed 
I'm, act I'm actually showing this polymer here. It's transcribed and transcribed, and then at some point it stalls, and then starts being driven backwards. Whether it's because the force we're putting or the, the thermal environment. It, so we're driving the, the polymerase into what's known as a backtrack. And once you've driven the polymerase backwards, it's completely, it's, it's rendered completely non-functional. It can't continue until it goes forward again. What this, what this uh, transcription factor does is it allows it to rescue from a backtrack. So the RNA polymerase, when it's in its incompetent state, this, this particular transcription factor allows it to just continue. Whereas this transcription factor, which again, TF2F will allow it to transcribe against higher forces, making it stronger, it can't actually recover from a, from a backtrack again. So these are the unique sorts of things that we're seeing uh, about RNA polymerase and other proteins that happen in your cells. And we're trying to finally understand how it is that these various transcription factors are affecting the machine that we're studying. And in hope, like the hope is, is that eventually we can learn enough about the, the molecule and how RNA polymerase works that we can develop new drugs, new designs, et cetera. So when it stops moving forward again, it then begins to work. So you're saying it's yes. Like That's correct. No, no. so um, the, what, what TF2S does, uh, I didn't want to get too into it, but what, what it allows you to do is uh, the RNA that, again, the RNA has already been made. The, the RNA polymerase starts dri being driven backwards, but that RNA is still there. The reason RNA polymerase is incompetent to that point is because it doesn't have a free end to keep adding to, right? The RNA, it doesn't, it, it doesn't see the free end of the RNA. So what this transcription factor does is it allows the RNA polymerase to cleave the RNA and form a new end that it can continue again. So it'll actually release a small fragment of the RNA that was already transcribed and just keep adding from where it was. So that's that's exactly what this transcription factor does. And it's only from data that you're seeing here that allows us to answer very detailed questions about how that mechanism happens, how quickly it occurs, and you know what it's actually doing to this to the thermodynamic properties of this, this Brownian ratchet. Um, so conjugation strategies would be another lecture, but um, the, the basic idea is, is that we find um, other things in biology that allow us to make attachments between proteins that we want to study. So the, the common one that we perhaps we could describe is uh, antibodies. So antibodies have evolved to very carefully and specifically recognize um, certain proteins. So we, we have an antibody, for example, that was raised against RNA polymerase. So that means that this antibody attaches to the RNA polymerase. So what we do is we coat one of these beads. We just take it with uh, antibody that's specific for the RNA polymerase. And then when we have this, this conjugation happening, you can essentially bring the two beads together. The antibodies form that conjugation. And then eventually, when you keep probing, eventually you see that when you go to a certain distance, you see that a force is being generated. And that's the only way that we know that a molecule is even there. So we're completely blind to what's going on. So we're literally probing and probing and probing, and eventually we'll see that a force is being generated. And then we know that the two beads are connected by something. So the, the, the question is, uh, when the RNA polymerase transitions from its promoter binding complex to, the, or confirmation, to the re, reoriented, redesigned synthesis machine that it has to become, um, is that a passive process or an active process? It is purely passive. So what they think is happening uh, is that the RNA that's being generated initially, um, remember the RNA polymerase, when it binds the DNA, there is no RNA present hasn't started synthesizing anything yet. As it starts synthesizing, it also has to advance. At a certain point, what they think is happening is the RNA that's, that was initially produced basically kicks out a, re a region of the RNA polymerase. That there's a, there's a steric clash that one part of the bound polymerase inter clashes with the RNA, and that kicks it out. 
So it's thought that there, this is more or less how it is that the, the reshaping of these proteins would happen between the initial phase of transcription, which is what I'm showing here in one. Right, so we, we actually compare with uh, what we call bulk measurements. So the, the classical biochemistry measurements that have been done, uh, what we would do is, for example, make a test tube of RNA polymerase transcribing a certain length of RNA, and then we would compare that with RNA polymerase that we also have antibodies present in for the region. We want to make sure that really the RNA production has been done. But again, the, deep, the level of detail that we're seeing here can only be seen with these sorts of measurements. So I, I, I can only tell you that from the, the basic understanding about how it is RNA is produced over time, there is no difference. But whether or not pauses or backtracks happen, we can't see that because we have so many molecules in solution. But I think it's pretty pretty accepted that you know the, if there is an effect on, on the molecule, it's going to be minor. Okay, so why do we care about single molecule biophysics? All right, so this is an example that I, I think was the most uh, interesting for, for me, and, and it, it's only a few years old, so um, I, I wanted to introduce it. This is an example of single molecule DNA sequencing. A company known as Pacific Biosciences in Menlo Park is actually doing this now. Um, and really, the, the idea is, is pretty simple here. You have very, very small holes in a metal film. Okay, so you can't see through the metal. You can see all this right here. I'm showing you an array of all of these holes. So the place you don't see light, that's the metal. So the metal is basically excluding light that's, that's coming out. Um, and each of these holes, you can see that a lot of the light that, that is being shined from the back is largely attenuated. So they, these, are, these are very, very small. So we're talking about 60 to 80 nanometers in diameter. And, and what they do is they attach a polymerase, in this case a DNA polymerase, so this is a polymerase that's responsible for synthesizing DNA, uh, copying the DNA. Um, so you have a DNA polymerase that's sitting at the bottom of that hole. Here again, you can see the array of all the holes on top. On the top of the side of this, you're flowing in the bases that are going to be incorporated, okay? A, C's, G's, and T's. Each of the bases is given a different colored flor fluorophore. So them is labeled fluorescent, which is a very different color. So you have four different colors, and what they're what they're trying to do is basically look at something like this. Here's the DNA polymerase. A C in this case is labeled yellow. It comes in, it binds, and then once it's incorporated, this fluorescent label is cleaved, it flies off, and then you see a drop in the fluorescent. So by looking at what color you actually see generated, you can know that, okay, the DNA just had a C at that position. And then down here, you see for the blue, maybe it's an A. All right, so this is what the data actually look like. So this is, again, a single DNA polymerase synthesizing DNA. They're using it to sequence, to find out based on the colors that are generated, what the sequence of a given DNA molecule are. So you look at all these fluorescent bur bursts over time. In this case, they're just looking at C. And then down here, you can clearly see that you have the rises of the blue in this case, and then rises of red in this case, corresponding to C and for many Gs in, in, in a stretch. And then you can see that if you go G, G, C, G, G, C, you can see that again, you see red, red, blue, red, red, blue. Okay, so they're using this right now for sequencing DNA and, and a number of other things. Um, but I, I hope from, I'm not actually sure what time it is, but I hope um, I hope if you walk away with nothing else, um, you appreciate that pr when you start thinking about proteins, I hope you think about nano them as nanomachines. I've, I've, that that's really kind of transformed my way of thinking about biology. Um, single molecule approaches are allowing us to look at the, the activity of these motors in very high detail that wasn't really possible 10 or 15 years ago. Um, Protein function is again tied intrinsically to how it's designed. And our, our, the future, I should say, of biology is to get to a point where we understand all of these nuances and all of these designs well enough 
that we can start generating synthetic protein. So this is a whole region uh, that, you know, a whole field that's being created called synthetic biology. And, you know, I, I see 50, I mean, 50 years ago, if you compare what we know today to what we knew 50 years ago, I mean, it's, it's breathtaking. So I can only imagine 50 years from now, I mean, we could really get to a point where we're seeing proteins being designed from scratch because we understand how it is the amino acids correlate to its structure, how those structures we're forming affect whatever function we're trying to give it, whether it's synthesizing RNA, synthesizing DNA, breaking down sugar. I mean, there, all of proteins do all of that. And then finally, like new frameworks are emerging in the life sciences and, and New paradigms are emerging that allow us to think about these problems from a completely unique perspective. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, members of the transcription team from my lab. Uh, my mentor is Professor Carlos Bustamante, who again was my biochemistry professor when I was an undergrad here. So if there are any undergrads in the audience, um, if you find any of your biochemistry professors who are really interesting, come back for a postdoc. Um, and all of the members of the transcription team and uh, funding for making this live and working. So uh, thank you for your time. Certainly, coordination biology is 
well regulated, and that's really been the evolutionary challenge for biology. How do you regulate it? Because our fundamental yes, the operating So, so within this machine, there is a, what's known as an active site. So this active site is a very specific location inside of this structure where the synthesis is actually happening. So the, the chemistries that are being used to, to add sequential nucleotides to a growing RNA all happen in the same spot. So when an RNA polymerase slips backwards, that, that active site goes from the end of its current RNA that it's been adding on to, it slips backward onto the, the already synthesized strand. Where it cleaves is exactly where that active site is located at the time this transcription factor comes in. So the RNA polymerase has no real idea how many, how many bases it's actually cleaving off. It could be two one time, it could be five the next. It doesn't care. All it cares about is the fact that this transcription factor has come in, it's allowed it to cleave the RNA, and wherever the active site is at that moment, is cleaving the RNA at that moment. They're completely different. Uh, so the, the uh, structure I was showing that was moving all, all around, that's a T7 RNA polymerase, that's from a bacteria phase, which is a virus that's very specific to bacteria. Um, and, and you look at viral RNA polymerases versus bacterial RNA polymerases versus eukaryotic RNA or RNA. They get progressively bigger and more complicated. And so our um, RNA polymerases, for example, require a, a huge number of, of auxiliary transcription factors just to act. The one that I was showing you that was rearranging itself, it acts by itself. It has no cofactors necessary for it to synthesize. And that's that's on the virus end of things. We're on the other side. But from the perspective of understanding how a machine is designed, that's why I said my my love is that bacteria phase, because that is a sin that is about um, more or less 25% the size our RNA polymerase. So it's one of the smallest. It's only, it's only 100 kilodalton, 800 amino acids or, or so. And, you know, with that very limited amount of, of material, it has a very complicated design that, that's allowed it to transcribe just as well. It's actually one of the fastest and the most powerful motors that, that's known. So there's a big mystery about why it is that on the simplest scale of RNA polymerases, you have fast and strong and in our RNA polymerases, they seem to be much weaker and slower. And what we think is happening is that the virus doesn't need to regulate the machine to run. Its job is basically to synthesize as many genes as possible as quickly as it can to propagate. Whereas our RNA polymerases, unregulated R transcription is what causes cancer. So I mean, this is ultimately the trade-off that we made. The more complicated the organism, the more regulation you need. So we want purposely a slower and a weaker RNA So um, the RNA, so for example, the, the optical trapping assay that I showed you where we have two different optical traps. Um, initially, optical trapping has this one optical trap, and for a long time it was used that you had a bead attached to something that was attached to the surface of a slide, for example. What we found eventually is, is that the surface of a slide held in a microscope is going to move and drift with time 
relative to your optical trap, which is being defined by a laser. And this relative drift is ultimately limiting our ability to see the details that I was showing. The, 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 the mechanical drift of the system is so large that we really were obscuring all the biological activity because our microscope is drifting. So um, ultimately, you know, it was developed uh, to have two optical traps where we essentially have two species that are freely levitating in solution. And we're decoupling. So if the microscope is, is drifting, you don't care because your beads are being restrained within a flow cell that I mean, isn't really attached. Your molecule of interest is not attached. That's one example of a technical advance that has really kind of opened up the doors for what we're doing now. Um, it, there are DNA nanotechnologies that are coming online that are really improving some of the, you know, there's a whole field called DNA origami where you're using DNA to form these really rigid structures that are potentially helpful for some of the techniques that we have. I mean, I, 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 I'm looking forward to seeing what happens in the future, but I think it's, um, I, I'm not sure that any of us really know what the magic point is, otherwise 